we're going to look at the anti-ice system now, the ice and rain protection system. And that system comprises of these subsystems. So we have a wing anti-ice system using hot air from the engines. We have a cowl anti-ice system using hot air also from the engines. We've got a windshield heating system that heats both the main screen and the side screens electrically. <clears throat> We've got our air data sensor heating system that heats all the pitot probes. <clears throat> and we also have an, uh, an ice detection system to alert the crew when they're in icing conditions and then we'll allow them to switch everything on. The wing anti-ice system maintains the wing leading edges at a certain temperature that um, will prevent ice buildup. So it's quite efficient. So it's modulating the wing anti-ice valves to achieve a target temperature, no more, no less, and that stops ice buildup. Hot bleed air is extracted from the 14th stage bleed air manifold to do this, ducted to the leading edges and ejected through piccolo tubes, which impinges on the leading edge inner surfaces. The air, the air is then exhausted overboard um, beneath the leading edges through some vents. Wing anti-ice control that uh, is available in automatic and semi-automatic modes, and we'll look through that later. <clears throat> the cowl anti-ice uh, system prevents ice buildup on the cowls by heating them up in a similar way, but um, it's kind of either on or off, and it's not modulated like the wing system is. And again, we're using 14th stage air to do that. The windscreen system uh, provides a dual temperature heating function on the main windshield and a single temperature heating uh, function on the side windows. This prevents ice accumulation, provides defogging effect and reduces face, face ply cracks due to thermal stress. To prevent ice accumulation, the air data sensors are all heated electrically, um, powering an integral heating element in each data sensor. And there's certain logic as to when they are switched on. Two ADS heater controllers control power to the heaters. Operation of the, each controller is initiated by a probe switch on the anti-ice control panel, which we'll take a look at in just a sec. The, the aircraft is equipped with two ice detection systems, which provide a visual cockpit warning of ice accumulation. But pilot action is required to turn on the anti-ice system. So that's the wing and cowl, the windscreen heating, and the, and the probe heating is normally switched on all the time until we're clear of icing conditions. So there's nothing automatic, even though we've got an ice detector, it detects ice, provides a warning, but the crew have to switch everything on. Here, are, here is our ice or anti-ice control panel, which is a part, on the, a part of the overhead panel. So down on the bottom row, you've got the left and right windscreen heating uh, control switches. You've got an off reset position, a low and a high position. You've got uh, left and right probe switches on or off. And when it's in the on position, doesn't necessarily mean they come on because it then there's a certain logic, which we'll go through later. For the wing anti-ice, you've just got a single switch off, standby and normal. Um, so when it's in the normal mode, the control of the anti-ice system will maintain a leading edge temperature of 87.7 degrees. Um, when you put it into the standby mode, it's kind of on or off to a certain point. So it switches on at 49 degrees C, the windscreen heats up, uh, sorry, the wind leading edge heats up. When it gets to 82 degrees C, it switches off and then it's allowed to cool down, it'll switch back on again at 49 degrees C. So it's like a semi-automatic mode. Obviously off is off. The next door to that you see, um, it looks like a switch, but it isn't a switch, it's just a, um, uh, an indicator. It says left heat and right heat, and those lights will illuminate when the um, wing leading edge is of, is of sufficient heat. And we'll look at the reason why we have those lights uh, a bit later on. Then you've got two, switches for the cowl anti-ice it's either on or off <clears throat> controlling them left and right separately and there's a test switch to test the uh, ice detection system um, um, and simulate some icing conditions and make sure you've got uh, all the systems working properly there's also a test switch for the windscreen heating as well 
So the anti-ice ducts are similar to the bleed air manifold ducts. They're, they're made of titanium. They've got an insulation um, with a thin stainless steel outer a covering to protect them uh, or protect the surrounding structure from um, heat. The piccolo tubes, they're made from titanium as well and are made up of three sections each for, the, for each of the wing leading edge sections. The forward face of each tube is um, just tiny little holes from which the bleed air is ejected, on, spraying onto the leading edge inner surface, which heats up. After heating the leading edge, the air is then exhausted overboard through louvres in the bottom of each section. And there's a shroud that protects the front spar from the hot bleed air. So the wing anti-ice valves control the flow of hot air bleed um, to the wing piccolo tubes and um, they contain a shut off solenoid which is energized to open and a torque motor that receives a variable current to vary the position of the valve. Uh, we'll talk more about that later on. The valves are located in the 14 stage bleed air duct and are controlled either automatically or semi-automatically by the switch on the wing anti-ice panel which we saw earlier. Now we haven't covered the pneumatic system yet but in the pneumatic system there's a 10 stage duct and a 14 stage duct. The 14 stage duct is used for the wing anti-ice or all the anti-ice systems plus the reverse thrust system and the 10 stage duct is used for all your air conditioning. The APU will only feed into the 10 stage duct. So you have to have the engine supplying air to get air in the 14 stage. The wing anti-ice valves are normally closed, so i.e. when the solenoid is de-energized, they will close. And um, but when it's open, it's energized open and uses air pressure to, to operate um, a diaphragm and open up the valve. The maximum output pressure of the anti-ice valve is 40 odd PSI. And when the wing anti-ice valve is selected off, the solenoid is de-energized and the wing and the valves will close by actuator spring force. We have a 14 stage isolation valve, which basically is acting like a cross bleed valve and it's separating the left and right hand sides. And if we open up the isolation valve, it allows the left and right sides to be joined together. Um, it's identical to the 10 stage isolation valve energized open and operated by a 14 stage isolation switch on the bleed air panel which we haven't seen yet. Um, there's a micro switch um, to give an indication when it's open and the open light will illuminate once the butterfly valve moves away from the fully closed position. So once it starts moving when it gets to eight degrees away from the fully closed position it's considered um, as far as the system is concerned to be open and the open light will come on. So we have a wing anti-ice controller that's an electronic control unit that, that controls the wing anti-ice valves automatically to maintain a specified leading edge temperature. And it's this controller that's supplying that um, a variable current to the torque motor. It maintains the leading edge temperature and provides signals to operate the indicating lights can also detect and warn of an input sensor failures. It's located on the aft face of the rear pressure bulkhead, just near the APU uh, uh, enclosure. And it's powered directly from bus one, uh, DC bus one and two. These two power supplies are just uh, there for redundancy. The controller is continually powered in order to keep the um, overheat detection circuit functional, even though the wing anti-ice system may be switched off. A possible overheat condition could develop if an anti-ice valve fails open, for example, when the system is selected off. We've got a couple of pressure switches located um, in the 14 stage duct, just either side of the isolation valve. Um, and we're using this to, to monitor the pressure in the wing anti-ice ducting when it's, when it's selected on. Um, so the switch contacts open at an increase in pressure of 9 psi and close at a decrease in pressure of 7 psi and, and this information is used to trigger the left wing anti-ice and right wing anti-ice caution messages which is indicating there's insufficient uh, pressure in the system. 
For the fully automatic mode, we use, a we use four temp sensors, two in each wing. One control sensor, which is the very outboard one, and one overheat sensor, one on each side. These are, um, um, these are thermoresistive devices, which have a positive coefficient of resistance. That is to say, as temperature rises, their resistance increases. Um, these resistance or temperature changes are used for the, by the automatic controller for control and heat detection functions. If any sensor should fail, i.e. either an open or short circuit, the wing anti-ice sensor caution message is displayed. A discriminating circuit within the controller inhibits channel operation, i.e. heat light and overheat indication in the event of a faulty overheat sensor. So in addition to those four sensors, two on each side, that are used for the automatic control, we also have um, two standby thermal switches, one on each side, to operate the anti-ice system when we're in standby mode. And um, with this, it's a switch, and with these, um, with the switch contacts open, the, um, the anti-ice system is basically sw switched off. And then as the temperature falls, when it gets to 49 degrees C, the switch will close again, um, reactivating the anti-ice system. So the wing anti-ice system will, will maintain that temperature range between 49 and 82 degrees C, and it's kind of fluctuating between those two zones. Whereas with the automatic mode, it's set, it's set to a fixed temperature and it keeps it maintained at that set temperature. So within the controller, we've got two uh, circuits, the heat detection and failure detection circuits. Um, so the, the, the heat detection or control um, circuit comprises of, it's, or is using the two outboard temp sensors, one on each wing. That's their, their input in their information into the controller and the controller will then use the highest of those two values as the point of reference. And then it will modulate and send a signal to the torque motor to modulate the anti-ice valves so we maintain a leading edge temperature of 87.7 degrees C, regardless of what's going on. Um, so once it gets to 87 degrees C, it starts to reduce the torque motor current and increase it again as it starts to decrease temperature. So it's maintaining that 87.7 degrees C as a constant level, using the highest of the two control sensor inputs. So if you remember on the anti-ice panel, we said there were two lights um, and it looked like a switch, but it wasn't a switch, it was just an indicator light. It says left heat and right heat. These lights will be illuminated by the controller once there is sufficient heat in the wing leading edge. And um, so part of the control circuits within the controller is something called the sufficient heat monitor. So once that gets to 29.4 degrees C, which is 85 degrees Fahrenheit, the, it will then energize a sufficient heat relay which will illuminate the left or right or both um, heat lights. This basically tells the crew that there is sufficient heat available on that wing for effective anti-icing. Um, so actually, if you have a low pressure condition, um, as long as you've got sufficient heat, you're not really worried about the low pressure condition. Should a failure occur and the leading edge temperature goes above 130 degrees C on either wing, using the overheat sensor, the overheat monitor circuit activates and you'll get a wing overheat warning message and a wing overheat voice message. Uh, and the crew would then have to switch everything off at their discretion. Selecting the anti-ice test switch to the wing position will perform a test of the sufficient heat and the overheat detection circuits. The controller is also monitoring for any failed sensors. So should any of the four temp sensors fail, i.e. the two control ones, the two overheat ones, become open or short circuit, it will generate a message wing anti-ice sensor caution message. If an overheat sensor has failed, then 
you'll get the message, the sense of fail message, but um, uh, it won't, it, it will inhibit the overheat uh, warning just to avoid any spurious uh, indications. So let's look at the normal mode of operation. So uh, if we assuming we've got bleed air available in the left and right ducts, um, and we activate the system by switching, switching the toggle switch to the normal position. Um, once you put the toggle switch to the normal position, a control relay is energized and the anti-ice valve will receive 28 volt DC from the battery bus to the um, solenoid. And the left anti-ice valve gets it from essential bus again to the solenoid. So that will energize the solenoid, allowing them to open. At the same time, power also goes through to the torque motor of each valve. The amount of current going to the torque motor is controlled by the controller, and it depends on how much we need to heat up the wing by. So the controller modulates uh, the valves, both valves together, to maintain this temperature of 87.7 degrees C. Um, on, and, and of course, it's used in the highest of the two control inputs. Um, to adjust the uh, both anti-ice valves. Once the temperature goes up to 29.4 degrees, the sufficient heat monitor now illuminates the two heat lights. So we, the crew know that we've got sufficient heat in the wings and everything's good, good, good. Um, if a condition of low pressure, less than seven PSI to a wing piccolo tube occurs, and persists for a period of time, probably caused by a valve failure, you'll get the left wing anti-ice or right wing anti-ice caution message. But that message will only come on when we're below the sufficient heat uh, threshold. So even though it might be less than seven PSI, as long as we've got sufficient heat, it doesn't really matter. So you won't, in that, in that situation, you won't get the fail uh, caution messages. So normally the isolation valve is closed and you've got the left side doing the left side, the right side doing the right side. If one wing should indicate a failure, i.e. low pressure, the 14 stage isolation valve can be opened and that will restore pressure using air from the other side. And that valve is operated by the 14 stage isolation switch on the bleed air control panel. And when it's open, the white isolation light indicates that the valve is open more than eight degrees. Um, the failure message should go out of view once pressure is restored to that side. If a failure occurs and the leading edge temperature goes gets too hot, it gets to 130 degrees C, you'll get a wing overheat warning plus a voice message wing overheat. In this event, the crew must then switch the anti-ice system off. It doesn't close on its own. They switch it off. The anti-ice valves will close and the air supply will be shut off and the wings will cool down. Once the wings cool down, we go below 130, the overheat warning will cease. The, what the crew can then do is select the standby mode and then they need to closely monitor for any overheating. So we're using a, a separate sensor now and actually we're taking the wing anti-ice controller out of the uh, equation. But if that overheat warning comes back, the, the next step for the crew would be to isolate the 14 stage system and they have to switch off the 14 stage bleed air supply. But take a look at the standby mode now. Don't worry too much about the picture if it's too small and you can't see it. On the next slide, we'll blow it up and we'll walk through it step by step. But when we select standby mode, only the solenoids of the anti-ice valves will be energized. The torque motor doesn't come into it anymore the solenoids are only energized and that allows the maximum downstream pressure to go to uh, to be 40 psi and basically the anti-ice valves fully open. The control relay is not energized in this mode and neither are the wing anti-ice valve torque motors. Therefore, the valves don't modulate. They're either open or closed. When the temperature gets to 82 degrees C, as sensed by the standby thermal switch, um, the th thermal switch will open and that will cause a de-energization de of the solenoid valve and the valve will close, completely close. When the wing temperature drops below 49 degrees C, the switch closes 
and the anti-ice valve will then reopen and the solenoid gets re-energized. Both in this situation, both wing anti-ice valves are controlled independently by their own thermal switch. And as we go through the electrical diagram in just a second, you'll see that the um, temperature controller, the wing anti-ice controller, is completely out of the loop in the standby mode. OK, let's walk through uh, this this uh, controller and the standby mode and the automatic mode. So here we can see our controller and we've got our various circuits within the controller. So we've got our normal control system, we've got our overheat monitor and we've got our sufficient heat monitor. Um, feeding into the controller we've got our overheat sensor and then well, the left overheat sensor, the left control sensor, the right control sensor, and the right overheat sensor. Outside here, we've got the standby thermal switches, and you see they don't really feed into the controller. They're just sort of doing their own thing when we're in standby mode. We've got our switch here, which has got the off, normal, and standby mode. So these are the normal contacts. These are the standby contacts. And we're going to go through a, a normal control first and then we'll look at the standby mode. We also got various power supplies. So we've got two power supplies for the actual controller. One from DC Buzz 1, one from DC Buzz 2. Um, so they're just there for redundancy. And then we've got two power supplies for the, for the actual anti-ice valves. Um, one's off the essential buzz, one's off the battery buzz. And the power supply for that passes through these two relays here, which are the thrust reverse relays, the left and right thrust reverse relays. And we'll talk about what they do uh, just at the very end. So let's assume we're in, um, oh, sorry, before we do that, here's our anti-ice valve. So on the anti-ice valve, you have your solenoid, which is basically selects it on or off. And then the torque motor, which varies the position but it varies the pressure in that actuating chamber uh, to, to make it more open or more closed. But in order for the torque motor to actually do anything, the valve has to be energized. The valve always has to be energized to on, and then it's either, uh, and if we de-energize the solenoid, it closes. Once we energize it on, if we're in normal mode, the torque motor can then vary and modulate the valve. So let's assume then we're in normal mode. So the normal switch contacts are going to be in the normal position. So that goes to there, that goes to there, that goes to there. And that will then hook up power via the thrust reverse relay. If we just take, we just look at one side, okay, it makes it a little bit easier. We just look at one valve. Obviously, they're both being controlled the same, but we just look at one side. So uh, you put the switch to the normal position and that allows power to be routed from the buzz bar via that thrust reverse relay to this control relay. Boom. And it energizes. And when the control relay energizes, that power is now allowed to go through there, through there, through there, and up to here and energize the solenoid of the left anti-ice valve. Boom. So that will open. And actually, also, we've got power coming from here, from the other supply for the other side. That switches in normal. Boom, boom, boom. OK, and that one's energized as well. And we've also got power to the torque motor coming through here. We've got power to the torque motor. This control relay is, in, um, is being energized because we're in normal mode. And so that puts that power supply to the control as part of the controller, uh, wing anti-ice controller, the control circuit. Um, so the controller is going to vary how much current is allowed to flow through that torque motor to allow the valve to modulate. And, and basically that's based on the inputs from the left and right control sensors. Remember, there's discriminatory circuits in here that's going to take the highest reading. OK, it's going to take the highest reading of those two readings and then allow the current to be varied to the torque motors. So this one 
and this one. OK, but we'll just look at this one. It's a little bit easier. Um, so the, we've energized this. And we and the control the current is being controlled by the controller based on the control uh, sensors, the left and right control sensors. Once we've got sufficient heat, then the sufficient heat monitor will then send an output to the DCU, and it illuminates the sufficient heat light. Um, when we go to standby mode. We put the switch to standby mode, so these set of contacts here will go back to this position. And these set of contacts here will go to the standby position. So that goes to there, that goes to there, that goes to there. Now we have power from via the thrust reverse relay through the standby switch. This time it passes through the standby thermal switch. And as long as the th standby thermal switch contacts are closed, which they would be below um, uh, um, for, uh, 49 degrees C. These uh, will be closed if we're below 49 degrees C. Um, it puts power to the solenoid. Also, power is going to the torque motor, but because this control relay is not energized anymore, it doesn't really do anything. So the solenoid will energize. Boom, the valve will open and it starts to heat up. When it gets to 82 degrees C, the standby thermal switch will open and quite simply the solenoid is de-energized and the valve closes again. And then the temperature will drop. Once it drops below 49 degrees C, it closes, boom, 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 and it gets re-energized. So it's cycling in that range. And the controller is not having anything to do with it. It's still monitoring the, um, for the, an overheat condition. It, it, that's still happening but it's not having any control of the valve at all, nothing at all. It cannot control this solenoid. In fact, this, the wing anti-ice controller never controls the solenoid. That's done just simply by the switch <coughs> position. So if we have an overheat condition, the crew have to turn off the valve, turn off the anti-ice to, to close the solenoid. Um, also, you'll notice that the power supplies for the controller are coming in no, um, all the time. So as long as there's power on either the buzz one or the bat or buzz two, the controller is is uh, always energized. It doesn't matter even if this is switched off. And the reason for that, of course, is the overheat um, is the overheat condition is always being monitored. So it always is going to be monitored, even if it's switched off. So that's it in a very simple nutshell, very simple. In standby mode then, we switch on the standby switch and boom, we directly energize the solenoid via the standby thermal switch. Standby thermal switch will be in the position as shown here um, until it gets to 82 degrees and then it will open and the valve will close and it all cools down and then when it goes below 49 degrees C, it closes again. Um, so we said about this thrust reverse relay. Um, the thrust reverse uses 14 stage air pressure um, as well as the anti-ice uh, system. And the anti-ice system is taking quite a large demand off the 14th stage. The thrust reverse system also takes a, a big demand off the system and the system cannot cope with having the anti-ice on and the thrust reversers working at the same time the pressure would drop too low. And when the pressure drops too, too low, the thrust reverser basically would slow down and it becomes too slow. And we, what we ideally want is the thrust reversers to deploy as quickly as we can and to be able to restow them as quick as we can. So um, the thrust reverser has priority for the air supply point of view. So when the thrust reversers are in operation, this thrust reverser relay is energized and that was going to basically inhibit the anti-ice system and stop it from working, whether you're in normal mode or, or uh, standby mode, because it's going to affect them both. Because even in standby, even in normal mode, um, um, you won't get any power to operate the solenoid. OK, so it's there to prioritize the thrust reverse system because of the demand on the system. And that's about it, really. Quite a simple system. 
So remember the controller is controlling in, in um, normal mode. It doesn't have anything to do with the standby mode. You've taken that controller out of the equation, but all the time, whether in standby mode or normal mode, it's still doing all the overheat monitoring and uh, any sensor failure monitoring as well for that matter. Remember, if an overheat sensor fails, um, it's going to give us our CAS message sensor fail, and it will also inhibit the um, um, overheat warning, so you don't get any spurious um, um, messages. Okay, let's have a look at some other monitoring uh, things that take place. So we have a couple of advisory messages. Uh, wing anti-ice on tells us when um, we've uh, had ice conditions uh, detected and we've switched everything off. Um, that message obviously only comes on if the, only the wing anti-ice is on. The wing stroke cowl anti-ice on comes on if everything is on. The wing anti-ice OK advisory message, you only see that when you do a system test and it's passed. And there's a test switch on the anti-ice panel to do that. And the um, left wing anti-ice or right wing anti-ice caution message will come on if there's insufficient bleed air pressure and the sufficient heat light is not illuminated. The wing anti-ice sensor message, it's a caution message, will come on if the controller's detected a problem with um, the uh, overheat sensors, either an open or short circuit. A wing anti-ice, uh, sorry, a wing overheat warning message, along with the wing overheat voice message, will be activated when there is an overheat condition detected on either wing. Uh, that message is also stored in the MDC as well. Uh, because obviously once the uh, once the crew switch off the system and it cools down, those messages will go away. So it'd be useful to have it logged on the MDC. Um, for information on the anti-ice bleed air duct failures, you look at uh, section B of the bleed air leak detection system, which we're going to talk about when we do chapter 36. When the wing anti-ice is selected on, um, an amber arc is displayed on the N2 primary gauge. This is kind of um, uh, just an indication to the crew um, that uh, if they go into that area on the N2, there may be insufficient uh, air pressure. If the thrust lever is below 78% RPM, the digits and pointer, uh, pointer are amber, above 78% the N2, uh, they are green. So it's just warning them that one, if with the engine at this low RPM, there may not be sufficient bleed air pressure for the anti-ice system to work properly. There's a test switch on the um, anti-ice panel. It's got two positions, wing or detector. If you put it to the wing position, it does a test of the anti-ice controller to make sure that uh, power is available to the controller and also to, to check out all the internal circuitry. You do the test where everything's switched off. A successful test is indicated by the left and right heat lights lighting up, the wing overheat warning message, along with the voice message, and the wing anti-ice OK advisory message. Once you release the test switch, everything goes back to normal. So the cows are, are anti-iced using 14 stage bleed air, just like the wing system. <clears throat> and the air pressure is regulated by a cow anti-ice valve which is delivered via an ejector to the piccolo tube. So if you look at the picture there, you'll see um, you've got the cowl anti-ice valve, you've got the air supply coming down to the cowl anti-ice valve. Um, the anti-ice valve, when it opens, will then send the air through into the piccolo tube, but via an ejector. So the idea behind the ejector is to reduce the temperature by recirculating air within the plenum through the ejector. For want of a better way of describing it, it waters down the bleed air to use ambient air to reduce the temperature. So it just saves having a heat exchanger, I suppose. <clears throat> so as the bleed air passes down the, down the uh, tube, it draws air in through that ejector 
to kind of water it down. Um, after heating the, the leading edge, um, after heating the leading edge, the air is then discharged overboard through louvres in the lower casing, and we can see that in the top part of the picture. Uh, a small metal pipe supplies regulated bleed air when the cowl anti-ice is operating to anti-ice the T2 sensor, which is located in the engine inlet at the 11 o'clock position. And also what um, we can see there, and you can, you'll can you notice it on the skin of the uh, intake on the outside, a, a metal disc about an inch diameter, a shiny metal disc, that's actually the a pressure relief valve and when the pressure, if, it, uh, if, it, if the pressure relief valve operates, basically it pushes out a, um, a piston and you'll see on the skin, on the intake skin on the outside, you'll see this um, relief valve uh, piston thing pop out. Normally it's flush. Um, so that's what it is. People often ask me when they look at it, you know, what is it? It's about an inch diameter, nice and shiny. Um, is the pressure relief valve for the anti-ice system. So the control for the anti-ice, the Cal anti-ice system is on the anti-ice panel. We have two switches left and right. And so we control them individually. We can turn them on, one on, we can turn them both on. When you turn them on, the on light will come on as long as the valve is open and the pressure is good. Um, in actual fact, the cowl anti-ice valve itself works in the opposite sense to the wing anti-ice valve, i.e. when you select it on, the valve is de-energized, and when you select it off, the valve is energized, so it fails safe open. So um, you still need air supply to, to drive it open, because it's a, it's a pneumatically uh, actuated valve, but when it's de-energized, it defaults to open. So the on light comes on once it's been switched on, and there's pressure available. Um, so bleed air to the cowl is regulated by the cowl anti-ice valve up to a maximum of 50 psi g. This valve, as we said, is fail-safe closed, uh, fail-safe open, so if it's de-energized it will uh, open up as long as there's uh, air supply available. The cowl anti-ice valve is normally closed um, pressure PRSOV. So what we have is a solenoid to control it, but this time it's when the solenoid is de-energized, the valve is open. So what happens when the solenoid is de-energized? Air is ported down to the opening chamber, it pushes it down and it opens it up. Um, the air that pushes it down is regulated by a reference uh, regulator, <clears throat> and downstream the air pressure is regulated by um, a, 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 a shuttle valve that slides across and allows the downstream air to go up into the closing chamber of the um, actuator. So if air pressure exceeds the 50 psi, it will start to push it close because it will overpower any air pressure that's in the top chamber because the air pressure in the top chamber is regulated to a certain value. So it never changes. But the downstream pressure can obviously build up. And if it builds up too much, then pressure builds up in the closing chamber and starts to push it closed. And once it pushes it closed, or towards the closed position, realistically, uh, the pressure now downstream will start to decrease. So just downstream of the valve, there's a pressure switch. Operates at 9 psi increase in pressure, uh, 7 psi decrease in pressure, and this provides the correct cockpit indication when the valves open. So here's our uh, pressure relief valve that we mentioned just earlier. So it's in, in the duct in between the valve and the ejector to provide overpressure protecting protection for the cowl distribution duct, just in case there's a failure of the anti-ice valve. The relief valve goes at 136 psi and blows out the piston, relieving the pressure in the duct. Um, the piston blows out by shearing the locking wire which holds it in position. So um, you'll get a telltale indication that it's um, relieved when the aircraft comes back because you'll see that um, the uh, piston uh, protruding out. <clears throat> uh, 
So when the anti-ice switch is selected on, the valve is then de-energized. And actually, we'll look at the electrical diagram, diagram uh, in a couple of slides, and you'll see that there's no controller controlling this. It's a direct sort of signal from the switch. Um, but we'll look at that later. So when the anti-ice valve is switched on, the valve itself is de-energized, and bleed air pressure will then you, uh, act as muscle power to open up the valve. Once it's selected on and pressure downstream builds up, when it gets above 9 psi, the green on light in the switch will illuminate. The other cast messages we get are left and right cowl anti-ice caution message. That comes on when it's switched on, but there's insufficient pressure. So that message will, will come on initially until the pressure builds up to activate the pressure switch. If the valve remains stuck in the closed position, and, the, and it's switched on, um, the, the downstream pressure switch will be, will be uh, less than 7 psi, and so obviously we're going to generate a amber message then. Selecting off closes the anti-ice valve by energizing it. If the anti-ice valve should fail open, um, such as if the circuit breaker opens, because remember you need electrical power to close it, the pressure switch will be activated because we're more than 9 psi, and we'll also get a cowl, that same message, the cowl anti-ice amber message. So that amber message, really, we can summarize it to say it comes on if we've selected it on and there's insufficient pressure, or we've selected it off and pressure is still too high. Once the anti-ice valve is opened and we've selected it on, then we get the green advisory left or right cowl anti-ice. If we switch them both on, it just says cowl anti-ice on. And then obviously if the wing is on as well, you get wing cowl anti-ice on. Okay, so we'll go through the electrical diagram in just a minute, but before we do that, just read this through to you, just so we can clarify everything and summarize everything. So as with the wing anti-ice, the cowl anti-ice valves are automatically closed when thrust reversers are deployed to allow the thrust reversers to um, uh, work quickly. Now, obviously, during the time when we, if we've selected it on and they're now being forced closed, what we don't want to do is throw up any sort of warning messages. Um, so those left and right Cal anti-ice caution messages will be inhibited during that time. Once the thrust reverser lever is raised um, to go into the reverse thrust situation, the left and right ice anti-ice disable relay is energized. This causes the left and a, left and um, and right anti-ice valve to close by energizing the solenoid. Remember, and the right um, cow caution message to be uh, inhibited. Uh, the opposite side, uh, the opposite will apply to the right hand side. So we are controlling these cows, um, the anti-ice individually, if you like, left and right. When the thrust reverser is stowed, the anti-ice disable relay remains energized for five seconds before relaxing. And then after this, the anti-ice valve and caution messages will return to their normal operation. Normally, of course, both thrust reversers are deployed on landing so that both anti-ice valves will close and both cowl anti-ice caution messages are inhibited. So let's take a walk through this electrical diagram for the cowl anti-ice system very straightforward, very easy, no controller to worry about, no temp sensors to worry about. We just directly control the cowl anti-ice valve from the switch. The picture shows everything switched off, and as we know with the sw system switched off, we need to energize the cowl anti-ice valve to make it close. So we have a power supply from the battery bus. It's routed through the on-off switch, which is in the off position. And it comes along and boom, 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 it energizes the cowl anti-ice valve. And as long as there's air pressure available, um, the cowl anti-ice valve will close. When we turn on the anti-ice valve, we switch on the switch. That's going to interrupt the power supply to there. <clears throat> so there's no more power coming here anymore. That's going to then just simply de-energize and the valve will open. Once the valve's open, um, we go in to close it if the thrust reversers deploy. So what we have to do is now re-establish that link to the and get power to the solenoid to close it. So um, um, 
Uh, that's done by the thrust reverser relay here. So when we select the thrust reverse, power now comes on. It's bypassing the switch. Boom, boom, boom. Energizes this and the anti-ice valve will close. The DCU is monitoring what's going on in terms of the pressure and the position of the switch. So with the pressure more than 9 psi, the pressure switch is open. The DCU will then lose that ground signal there and it's going to compare that with the, um, the position of the switch. And as long as everything all kind of lines up, then it will then illuminate the cowl anti-ice on advisory message and illuminate the cowl anti-ice uh, on light in the switch. If the system switched off, obviously we're going to have a low pressure condition, so the DCU will see that ground signal there when there's low pressure, below 7 psi, and it's going to compare that with the position of the switch. Obviously in that situation it's going to be expecting to see the switch off, so it will have lost the ground signal from here. But if we've selected it on and we've got low pressure, there's obviously a discrepancy. So it's going to illuminate the cowl anti-ice caution message and remove that on light. That message, remember, is inhibited, though, um, during the thrust reverser, uh, go, when the thrust reverser is deployed and the valve is, is force closed. And, and pretty much that's it. There's nothing really more we can say. It's a very simple um, system. So we have two anti-ice, uh, sorry, two ice detectors, which alert the crew um, when we get an accumulation of ice of more than uh, 20 thou of ice accumulated on the detector. Um, they are designated as system one and two for the left and right ice detectors respectively. Once we've detected ice, we alert the crew with some messages, but pilot action is required to turn on all the systems, so that's the wing and the cowl systems, until we're free of ice. So the ice detection system consists of the anti-ice panel plus those two detectors. So the ice detectors, remember there are two of them, they're the vibrating probe type ice detector. So they operate on 115 volts um, and they comprise of um, like a control unit in the in the base of it and it's basically vibrating at a certain frequency you, you can't you can't see it or hear it or feel it but it's vibrating at a certain frequency when ice builds up on the probe bit that sticks out um, it causes that the frequency to change and the control unit, which is part of the ice detector itself, will detect that change in frequency and it will do then a couple of things. Um, number one, it will then issue the ice detected uh, caution message and um, we'll talk about the colour of the messages later actually because they change, but it initially, initially will issue the ice detected caution message and at the same time will turn on a heater to heat up the probe and the strut. Now that will cause the ice to melt very rapidly. It, that, that ice detector, when the heating's on, gets very hot very quickly. So the heating will cause the ice to melt and then the probe will go back into the normal frequency range and at that stage the heater is then switched off. And the controller is now looking and waiting to see if the ice builds up again. The ice detected message is, is basically going to be latched for a minimum of 60 seconds. So it heats it up, the probe goes back to the normal frequency, uh, the ice detected message is, is, is displayed but it's latched on for at least a minute. Um, and if ice is, if we're still in icing conditions and ice builds up again, then the whole cycle is keep, keeps on repeated. And it keeps on doing that until eventually we clear of ice so it's heated it up, it goes back to the normal frequency. One minute later, if we haven't detected any more ice, the ice detected message is then cleared up. And then the crew can then switch everything off. 
So also within the ice detector, there's some uh, failure detection circuitry, which is monitoring the ice detector to make sure everything is going good, working good. Um, if it detects a failure of the ice detector, the, it will generate a, um, via the DCU, it will generate an ice detector one or two status message, um, assuming only one has failed. If both ice detectors fail, the DCU um, will um, basically say, oh, hello, that's an ice detector caution message because they both failed. But if only one fails, then the DCU just gives us a status message because from a crew point of view, as long as we've got the other one working fine, it doesn't really make much difference to them. There is a test switch uh, as well on that um, test panel. On the, on the anti-ice panel, there's that test switch where it's got wing position and it actually says detector position. Um, you can't see it on that picture because it's obscured by the actual switch, but it says detector and it's spring loaded in the middle. And when you do the test to the detector position, <clears throat> you basically request the controllers to do a built-in test of their circuitry. And uh, obviously any failures will be um, illuminated. Um, so if a failure is detected, that output signal is latched. That failure output signal is latched and it cannot be reset until you remove power or you um, pull the ice detector circuit breakers and reset them. If the fail light comes on again, um, then the only thing you can do is replace the ice detectors. So as we said, if both ice detectors fail or in, in op, but you get an amber ice detectors message um, rather than the status ice detector fail message. So when you test that toggle switch to the detector position, it does, an, uh, it does a test of the ice detector and the ice detector is looking at all the internal circuitry. It's making sure the heaters are working. It's making sure the uh, ice warning and failure detection signals are all good. If the test is good, you will see an amber ice message generated. And then when the test switch is released, the ice message will disappear. Now, just um, let's just uh, take a step back, because I said earlier that when, a, when we fly in icing conditions, we alert the crew initially with an amber message. And then I said the colors change. So let's explain that now. So with the... Um, with the anti-ice system, as you know, everything is normally in the off position and they only select it on when they're in ice. So the ice detectors are there to detect the ice. When they detect ice, the initially, initially it will generate an ice amber caution message. <clears throat> so this tells the crew that you're in icing conditions. Now what the crew need to do is switch everything on. So they switch on the cowl anti-ice, they switch on the wing anti-ice and everything opens up. Once they've done that, that ice amber message now changes to an advisory message or a green message. So it just says ice on the secondary page. So this is telling them you're still in icing conditions, but don't panic because you've switched everything on. So, there, so you have two ice messages, amber one and a green one. The amber one means you've detected ice, but you haven't switched anything on yet. The green one means you're still in icing conditions, but hey ho, Everything is switched on, so don't worry. Once the ice has gone away, that, that ice message, either amber or, or green, will disappear. Okay, moving on to the windscreen and side screen heating now. Um, so we have a dual temperature heating system on the windscreen, the main screens, and, and a single temperature heating function on the side screens. So what that means is on the main screens, there's two basically temperature settings, but on the side screen, it's just a single one. Heating of the windscreen provides an anti-ice capability on the windshield anti uh, uh, outer panel, the face ply, in, a, in the high temperature setting, whilst providing a moderate defogging function on the, in the, on the inner surface. The low temperature setting is provided to keep the windscreen warm in flight to reduce thermal shocking due to rapid temperature changes and possible face ply cracking. And then they'll switch it to high mode if needs be. But the, the, wing, the windscreen heating system is basically switched on in, in at least low mode, um, regardless of um, 
the sort of uh, ambient conditions. In addition to the normal electrical heating, there is a foot warmer stroke demist system, which uses an, an electrical heater element and a fan to demist the inside of the windscreens. But we'll talk about that when we do chapter 31. Heating of the side windows is primarily provided for demisting since ice build up on the side window is very unlikely due to the shape of the windscreen and, and the angle that it, that it makes to the airflow. We have some controllers that control the windscreen heating. We've got controllers for the main screens and controllers for the side screens. Um, so one for each, one for each side. Um, we have uh, co-pilot's controllers, so co-pilot side screen and main screen, and co-pilot side screen and main screen. The main screen controllers are interchangeable with each other. The side screen controllers are interchangeable with each other, but you can't interchange a, a side screen and a main screen. To prevent uh, precipitation static buildup from getting discharged into the controllers and then there and then further down into the elect aircraft electrical system we've got these uh, p static suppressors they're two metal oxide varista suppressors they're installed between the each of the two power wires supplying the windshields and the aircraft ground The heated film, heating film um, is connected to exterior terminals on the inner surface of the panels and also provided our terminals for the temp sensors that provide temperature control and temperature limiting through the controller. Temperature sensing is done by monitoring one of the two temp sensors installed in each panel. Um, the second sensor is a spare one and you need to, if you need to use a spare one, you just uh, reconnect the terminals to the other sensor. <clears throat> These sensors are positive temperature coefficient devices, that is, as the temperature increases, so does the resistance. When the temperature de decreases, the resistance decreases. The side windows are constructed from two layers of acrylic with a PVB interlayer. Each window has a heating film, a conductive heating film, which they apply AC power. Um, and this coating is located on the inner surface of the outer main ply. We don't need a thin face ply like we've got on the main windscreen since the uh, temperature level, the heating level is, is a lot lower. Uh, therefore, the thin face ply required to transfer the heat um, is not needed. Temperature sensing and terminal connections are very similar to that on the main windscreen. The power supply for the heating film is directed from the respective controller and to the four screens that we heat so we have a, we've got we've effectively got a controller for each one the electrical inputs are 200 volts for the windshield heating 115 volts for the side heating and 28 volts dc for the control now if we look at the power supplies um we've got on the ac side of things we've got ac essential for the left controller side screen ac buzz one for the left uh, main screen AC Buzz 2 for the right main screen and AC Buzz 2 also for the right side screen. So if we think about that in terms of an ADG deployment situation, the only screen that's going to be heated will be the pilot's side. It seems a bit odd. You would think that the if you're going to have one screen, the, the one screen you would want would be the pilot's main screen. But anyway, I didn't design it, so I don't know quite what the uh, thought process was. Obviously, the side screens have less power consumption, <clears throat> but uh, nonetheless, only the side, the left side window will be heated in an ADG situation. The controller will regulate the temperature based on the temp sensor inputs by simply pulsing or cycling the AC power to the, to the various windscreens. So the controller pulses the um, 
temperature or, or the current to the windscreen so that we maintain 55 degrees C in high for the main screen and 39 degrees C in low uh, on the main screen. Side windows are maintained at a, a constant uh, level of 40.6 degrees, whether we've selected high or low. The controllers will shut down the windscreen system if we have any of the following problems. So an over temperature condition or an open circuit with the sensor um, or a short circuit with the sensor if the sensor resistance is below 150 ohms. An over voltage, so uh, between 130 and 135 volts AC uh, to neutral or between 225 or 230 line to line. A low current detected when the controller is trying to command a higher current. If there is current being applied to the window when the controller does not demand it. Or any internal fault such as an internal power supply failure. Any of those will result in the window system being shut down. So when there's a fault, um, the, the system switched off and um, uh, AC power to the heater element is turned off by de-energizing a fail-safe relay. And it would also trigger the corresponding left or right window or windshield heater or heat CAS caution message. To clear the fault, the cockpit switch has to be switched to off um, and then back on. If the fault persists, the fault detector is again latched and the CAS message will come back on. This system is designed for flight use only. and The windshield heating shouldn't be used to defrost uh, the windows on the ground. Uh, for this reason, the reason is that when you do this, melting ice runs down onto the window and it fools the sensor into thinking that the windscreen is actually colder than it really is. And so it starts to apply heat. Um, the result is that the windshield heat is continuously on and potentially it could cause rippling and distortion of the outer panels. On the control panel, there is a test switch. <clears throat> um, but you can only do the test when you've got the uh, switches in the high position. A successful test causes a four green left and right window or windshield heat OK advisory messages to momentarily come on. If a fault is detected uh, during the test, you get the or that that uh, green message doesn't display and you'll get the left or right heat window or windshield heat caution message instead. You should only do the test for one to three seconds. Um, the test doesn't work if it's switched off. If you do the test with the switch in the low position, only the side window circuits will be tested. You'll still get the, the messages, but only the side ones are um, tested. So we're going to move on to air data sensor heating now. Uh, this system uses 115 volts AC to heat up all the pitot static uh, probes and so on. And we've got two ADS controllers that control the power to the heaters monitor the current flow and test the integrity of the internal circuit. Operation of each controller is initiated by the probe switch on the anti-ice panel. But there is logic to the probe heating and just by having the probe switches switched on doesn't necessarily mean that the probe heating comes on because there is logic, uh, which we're going to go through a bit later. Um, also, uh, obviously when you jack the aircraft, you should make, the, make sure the probes are switched off switched off but also in the jacking procedure it does tell you to pull circuit breakers associated with the probe heating. So we've got two probe switches on the ice panel. When you turn the probes off this energizes an internal control relay which interrupts the power to the heating elements and when you put the, the probe switch to the on position it de-energizes the control relay and enables a AC power to control to the heating elements. So it's really important when we start pulling circuit breakers, we make sure we pull the correct ones. If you pull the circuit breaker for the control relay, you can inadvertently turn on the probe heating rather than switch it off. So there are circuit breakers to pull when you jack it up, 
The circuit breakers that you pull are the actual power circuit breakers, not the control circuit breakers. So do make sure you pull the correct ones, otherwise you can actually turn on the PTA heater rather than switch it off. There's a test switch on circuit breaker panel one, which is behind the captain. Um, and this is used to test or initiate self-test of the internal circuitry of all the two controllers. Holding the uh, test switch to the probes, uh, holding the test switch to test with the probes in the off position or the controller disabled uh, provides a ground signal to both ADS heat controllers. It causes all heater failure detection circuits to switch to the active to, to the active or operating state, and a faulty heater failure detection circuit will be displayed by a caution message. Um, so let's take a look at <clears throat> all the sensors that we're going to heat up first, and then we'll go into the nitty gritty of how they work. Um, two PETA static probes located on the left and right sides of the aircraft nose, each contain two integral heating elements for anti-icing. The tube heating element is located within the probe, while the base heating element is welded to the base of the probe. Two AOA vanes located on the left and right hand sides of the fuselage, each contain an integral heater element in the vane itself for anti-icing. We've got two static ports on the left and right set hand sides forward fuselage, each contain an integral heater element. Tap probe located below the aft side of the co-pilot side window contains an integral heating element. The standby pitot probe contains an integral heating element and the auxiliary AOA vane contains uh, two heating elements, one for the vane itself and the other for the case. And actually also in the picture there you can see where the two um, uh, uh, heater controllers are, they're in the avionics bay under the floor. Two Air data controllers, air data sensor controllers are in the avionics bay as we saw. They are each capable of controlling up to eight heater each, six single channel heaters and two dual channel heaters. Each controller contains an internal power supply circuit, two heater power control relays, enable logic and eight current sensing or failure detection circuits, one for each heater element. OK, what we're going to do is attempt to walk through this uh, diagram step by step. It is a bit of a nightmare, so we'll try and go nice and slowly. Uh, the nightmare happens down at this part of the diagram here where you've got all this logic. OK, but don't worry about that at the moment. We'll get back to it. Let's just get ourselves orientated as to what's going on. Up here we've got our actual heaters, and if we pass a current through those heaters, they're going to heat up. Simple as that. And the source of the power, we won't go through every single one, it's pointless. We'll just choose one at random. So let's choose this one here, the left pito sensor. So we have a power supply from the 115 volts AC bus. It comes along here and comes to this relay here. As long as this relay is relaxed, we're jolly good to go. And the power will come up through here, passes through this current sense relay. And if we've got sufficient current flowing through the sense relay, which we would have if the heating was working properly, then this will cause this relay here to energize, which removes the ground signal from this this. Uh, output here <clears throat> so everything is good to go if there's insufficient current then you have a ground signal there and that would be an indication of a failure of a probe okay so don't worry too much about that so the current flows through there it's generated if it current if the good if the heater is good everything is good the current's flowing and it goes through the pitot tube, boom, 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 and the pitot heat tube heats up. And if it if it current's flowing, it's heating up. This current sense relay will be operated, in, so there's no fault showing. This second coil here, also linked into the current sense relay, is for the testing. 
So current passes through the second coil when you test it to test out the current sense uh, relay. Okay, that, so that so these second coils here, the upper ones, these coils only provide test capability with the PTA heating switched off, just to test the ability to detect a fault. So that's good. So we've got a power supply and we've got the heater element and if this relay here is de-energized, the heating is on because it's just hooking it up straight from the power supply Bosch. So the question is, what's going to control this relay? What's going to energize it? If we want to turn off the Peter heating, we need to energize this relay and it will switch off. So we have a control relay here. Now this is where it's going to get tricky. What we have is a power supply and we're looking for a ground. So when we do normal electrical circuits, we kind of trace it in that direction. Okay, we have a power supply and we look for a ground somewhere, which we're going to get over here or even here. But this logic is kind of back to front because the logic f is flowing in this direction. And so we have to bear that in mind. So we've got a power supply there. That's a given. That doesn't change. So we, we accept that. So what we're looking for is a ground which changes. So down here, let's read this note to do with the logic. So a ground equals zero a logic zero, an open equals one, a logic one. We got an OR gate, an OR gate, and an OR gate, and these little circles here are inverters. So um, we want to turn off the Peter heating. Let's do simple, simple. We're going to turn off the Peter heating by the switch, so therefore we want to um, energize this relay. So a zero is a, is a ground, so we have a zero here with it switched off. Everyone happy with that? We've got a ground signal there, that means we've got a logic zero here. If we've got a logic zero here, it comes scootling along here to here, and this is an inverter, so it changes it to a one. So we've now got a one there, and it doesn't really matter what we've got there. It's an it's a it's a uh, OR gate, so we're going to going to get a one out there, and this is also an inverter so that converts it back to zero, and if we've got a zero, that means there's a ground. So we have a ground signal, um, and if we have a ground signal, that means that control relay will energize, boom, which will turn off the beta heating. It turns off. So that's easy peasy. Let's turn on the Peter heating. If we turn on the Peter heating, does the Peter heating come on? Well, it depends on other things. Remember what we said earlier, just because you switch on the Peter heating doesn't necessarily mean it switches itself on because there's logic. So we're going to turn on the Peter heating. That means we're going to remove this ground signal. So we've now got a one to this top part of the uh, OR gate, which automatically goes to a zero. <coughs> the Peter heating will come on. Remember, what we're looking for is um, in order to turn on the um peter heat uh yeah to turn on the peter heating what we need is a zero here which effectively mean what we meet need is a one coming out of this or gate to turn it on now we've got a one uh, we've got a uh, we've got a zero on the top line because we've turned um the peter heating switched off uh, switched on we've switched switched so i do apologize we've switched on the peter heating that means we've we've got a one there but that gets inverted to a zero so we've got a zero at the top and we need to see what comes in at the bottom if we've got a zero at the top and nothing else then we get one out so that, that doesn't work uh so what we're looking at then is the passenger door remember 
um, when we looked at the door system, we said there was that micro switch. I said it's linked into the um, air data heating system. Well, here it is here. So if the passenger door is unlocked, let's assume the passenger door is open. If the passenger door is unlocked, then we're going to have a ground signal there. So that means we have a zero there. So we have a zero there, which gets converted to a one. So we now have a one there, which gets converted to a zero here. Because if it's one there, one comes out, but then gets converted to a zero. That means we have a ground here. So the pizza heating is off. Because we've energized this relay. The pizza heating is off. So even though we switched on the pizza heating, if the passenger door is open, the pizza heating is automatically off. The other part of the logic is whether the generator is online. So generator one, online boom generator two online boom you lose that ground signal there so let's assume uh, it would be unusual for the doors to be open um, and both generators running that would be kind of unusual that means you sat there with the engines running and the door open but you know it could happen so we've got the door open so we've got a uh, zero there We've got both engines running generator online. That means you have a one here because it's open circuit. So you've got a zero, one. That means you have a one out, but that gets converted to a zero. You now have a zero here. Pito heating switch is on, which, so you have a one there, but gets converted to a zero. So you've got zero, zero. That means you have a zero output, but it's turned into one. So zero, 0, coming out of the OR gate will get converted into a 1 by this inverter. And if you've got a 1, that's an open circuit. So the uh, control relay will be de-energized because it's open circuit. Um, so that means it will come on. So Peter Heating is switched on, the passenger doors unlocked, and the generators are online. That will cause them to come on. Actually, that was a, that was simpler than I thought. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. Normally, it takes me longer to go through that, so I'm just wondering what I've missed. So we can summarise that then. If you if you're in the hangar and you've got ah here we go this is it if you're in the hangar and you've got the passenger door open and the peter heating switched on because maybe you want to test it uh is it going to work because you use an external power you're in the hangar so peter heating is on so you have a one here which means you have a one there, but that gets converted to a zero. So you've got a zero at the top. Uh, the door is unlocked. So you have a ground signal there, which means that's a zero. And the generators are um, offline. So that's a zero. So you've got zero, zero. That means you have a zero out, but then you've got a one because of the inverter. So you've got a one and a uh, zero. If you've got a one and a zero, you get a one out, but that's converted to zero. You've got a ground signal, which means the Peter heating is switched off. So in the hangar, AC external power on, you go up there, switch on the Peter heating, nothing's going to happen. It won't work. Nothing's going to happen. Um, and the reason being is because the generators are not online. What you need to do to, if you want to test them, you have to close the passenger door. If you close the passenger door, I think you'll get away with it. Let's just see. Uh, let's just check that out, shall we? I'm making this up as I go along, as you probably can guess. So we have the Peter heating on. 
So that means we've got a uh, 1 there which gets converted to a 0. We're going to close the passenger door. Uh, so we now have a 0 here. And the generators are offline as we had before. So you get a 1. No, it's still not going to work. Because you've got a 0 and a 1. That gets So you have a 1 out but gets converted to a 0. Oh yes, it will work. So you have a 0 there. You have a uh, zero there. Uh, do we have a zero there? Got a zero there. What do we have here again? We've got a zero. So we get a one there. That means you get a one out, which gets converted to a zero, which is a ground signal. So the Peter heating is uh, that's energized, so it's switched off. So that won't work either. That won't work either. Let's go through that again. <laughs> Just check that out. So you're in the hangar. Passenger door is closed. Oh no, yeah, that's right. That's where we went wrong. But passenger door is um, passenger door is closed. No, sorry, you're in the hangar. Passenger door is open. You're using external power, so um, uh, that's all as it as it is with the ground signal because you're using external power. We we've got the Peter heating switched on. Um, the passenger door is. Uh, let's say we close the passenger door. So that's a zero which gets converted to a 1. We've got a 1 at the top. This is, uh, we've closed the passenger door, so that's a 0 there. There's no generator online, so that's a 0 there, which gets converted to a 1. So we get a 1 out here. Then um, we had a 1 there, so we've got a 1, 0. So that one output is turned to a zero, which is a ground signal, yeah, which turns it off. So yeah, it won't work. It won't work. <clears throat> it's like a safety thing. If you jack it up, uh, it does work. But you have to pull the circuit breakers. That would be the only thing you could do actually was to pull the DC circuit breaker for the control side. So this this um, this P2, this uh, power supply here is the power supply with an output where it says plus V. So anywhere where you see a plus V in the inside the control box, that's coming from this power supply. So if you pull this power supply, you by default. Uh, if you pull this circuit breaker, sorry, by default you de-energize this relay. It doesn't matter what this logic is trying to do. This relay will be de-energized, and as long as you've got power on the AC side of it, uh, the Peter heating comes on. <clears throat> so these are the circuit breakers here you pull um, um, when you do the uh, jacking up. Not this one. You pull these AC ones here. Not this panel here. Although this is on circuit breaker panel four, which is uh, um, that's down by the footwell. This is on circuit breaker panel three, which is on the other footwell. So do be very careful what circuit breakers you pull. If you pull the wrong one, you'll end up accidentally switching it on. I hope that was clear. So we got sorry, got a bit um, buggered up in the uh, logic. I always do it because of all these converting it back to one and all the rest of it. But if, you, if you've got any questions, drop me an email. But um, if you go through it, um, the bottom line is if you energize this uh, relay, the Peter heating is switched off. And if this relay is de-energized, it's switched on. Okay, don't panic, we don't need to go through this. Uh, this is just showing you the ADS controller number two, which is, which is doing all the right-hand probes. 
So the logic is all the same. It's just that the probes are different on this one.